hello, everybody. This is Jeff Besson with Intuit Face, joined by my very well uh, esteemed colleague, Sebastian Mounier. Seb, why don't you come join me? Hey, Seb. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Yes, bon année, as they say in Intuit Face. <laughs> Um, I'm hibernating, uh, proving that I don't have gray hair. And uh, Seb is uh, in Arizona. Is that where you are right now? Actually, yeah, I'm uh, right near the Saguaro National Park. We never, uh, we never know where he is. It's like, where's Waldo? I don't know. You got a Waldo in France, right? There's gonna be a where's. Yeah, we Ooh, just say Waldo. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. That's that's his name in French, but. Who a Charlie? Well, I want to thank everyone again for uh, spending the next hour with us. We have what we hope are some pretty interesting questions to answer for you. Some of you, if not most of you, have joined us previously. I think this is our third q &A. Um, It's an opportunity to share with you the questions that we found the most compelling over the past three months. A lot of these questions will be one-on-one -on -one questions. So we answered them for the person who asked it, but nobody else benefits from the answers. And that doesn't seem fair. And uh, this is a, a set of topics that fits that criteria. We think it's really interesting. We think everybody would benefit from it. So we wanted to spend some time and go through them with you. Uh, if we look at the agenda, we're gonna start with validation of form field entries. You're creating a form. You want names, email addresses, dates, who knows? And you wanna make sure they're entering the right kind of information. Is it really an email address, for example? Or is it expecting a number and they put in letters? You know, that sort of thing. So how do you do that with Intuiface? That'll be the first topic. Then we will go to, uh, I think a topic that's interested a lot of people uh, for quite some time, which is how to use and customize the shopping list interface asset. I, I suppose some of you don't know about this, but if you open the interface assets panel in Composer, um, you'll see this thing and you wonder, it might be wondering what the heck it is. We're not in the business of building interface assets and selling them. That's not what this was for. It's a reference implementation. It is an example of how one can create a shopping list, which doesn't have to be for retail. What it is is a list of things that people want to retain for some future purpose, maybe because they're buying it, maybe they want to print it, maybe they want to email it, who knows. We're going to walk through it. I'm going to show you how it works and how to customize it and how you can use it in your own experiences. Then we'll move on to the headless CMS. We've done a lot of work on the headless CMS over the past few months. In the past month, give or take, we did release base duplication. We wanted to talk about that a little bit, make sure you understand how it worked and uh, some of the sort of subtleties of this feature that are advantageous, meaning, for example, how you can move uh, bases from one account to another for base duplication. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll take a step back. We'll study in the world of headless CMSs, but we'll discuss what it means to incorporate multiple bases in a single experience. Not sure many of you even knew that was possible, but you certainly can. You can have multiple headless CMS bases in the same experience. Uh, how does that work? Why would you do it? And how does that work? How would you manage that? So we'll, we'll show you that. And then we'll wrap things up with a uh, a topic that I think for newbies, it doesn't even occur to you to think about it, but as you advance, uh, your level of skill with Intuiface, you discover that this is a pretty critical one, which is how to vary data retrieval from the head, headless CMS based on the location of the device. I mean, a simple example is I have some devices in Chicago, some devices in Boston, and what the Chicago devices need to show will vary somewhat from what the devices in Boston need to show. Same base, different data. Well, how do you do that? How do you configure it so that the experience is automatically retrieving the right data based on its location, the location of the device running the experience? So we're going to run through that as well and wrap it up there with some Q&A. So here's how Q&A will work. Uh, you have the Q&A panel in the GoToWebinar toolbar. At any time, you can ask questions there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of those. You ask the questions in the Q&A panel. I'll keep track of those. And when Seb, because I kept saying we're going to explain, I, I don't explain anything at all. It's also uh, when after Seb goes through the, the discussion, I will then curate some of the questions and we'll answer those live and then move on to the next topic. Some of you might ask questions that are completely off topic, but very interesting, or you might have something you want to hang on to. At the very end of the session, when we've covered all of the questions in today's agenda, we will uh, open up the floor and you can ask anything you want. So that's how it's gonna work. So 
Don't forget the Q&A panel. I'll remind you that periodically. Uh, if I think we're ready, right? Seb, are you ready? Yeah, I guess I am. I mean, besides right. the question about the Godi, uh, we'll see if we really start a challenge in 2023. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the question? You'll see that from, from, yeah, coming from Vincent. That's it's a not a goatee. One. It's a completely untamed wilderness. It's uh, <laughs> driven primarily by laziness. Um, all right, form field entries. Let me give you the presenter. Make you presenter. All right, Seb, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so back to my screen. So again, thanks for everybody for joining us today. Happy New Year again for all who've just arrived. Don't forget you have the little uh, question box in the top something corner uh, of your screen. Uh, please use it to ask questions about the topic we are going to discuss today, as well as any other topics we might discuss at the end of the session. So the first topic for today is form field validation. How do you retrieve information from your our customers from your end users using the kiosk in a public location, for example, and how do you make sure that this information is valid? Um, I'm going to I'm showing here the end result of one end result, and then we're going to dive into Composer and see how this is built. So <clears throat> usually for uh, names, um, phone numbers, messages, you want some minimum characters. So if I type here just uh, two characters and I try to go to the, my next field, either by hitting the enter key or just by clicking into another field, I will get this name two short three cars minimum because that's what I set for this field here. Uh, if I put more and then select another field, I do get an OK and this button get turns blue and we're going to see why in just a second. I did click the, the email address here and enter nothing. So of course, this is not a valid email address. If I type just a bunch of characters, it's still not a valid email address. So I really need to add my add symbol, something, what's the dot, dot com, that's okay. And then message again, I, I can do that. Oops, we want 10 characters this time, so I will add a few, a few more. Okay, now my three okay buttons are blue. This final okay button is blue and you can see this submit button becomes available. You may not have noticed that before, but if I go back to something wrong in one of the fields, I cannot click the submit button. This doesn't work. The button is disabled. So again, this is one way of addressing and showing the results. Of course, you don't have to put OK. You could put a nice green check mark. Uh, you could design it the way you want, right? Now, what's the mechanics behind the scene? And actually, before showing the experience in Composer, I just want to remind you that all of this can be found into this article, Create Forms for Collecting User Data at Runtime. If you scroll to entry validation, that's the exact example I'm using today. And if you scroll down a little bit, you do have a sample experience. Click this download link. You will get basically what I'm gonna show in the scene right now. But that's a long bunch of text. So let me try to explain it in this video in just a few, a couple of minutes uh, and to explain the main mechanism. So we have multiple mandatory forms. We want all of them to be valid to make sure that we enable this submit button, yes or no. So on all these OK buttons, we're going to check them. These are toggle buttons, by the way. We are going to check them when their corresponding field is valid or not. If it's valid, check. If it's not valid, uncheck. When we check the buttons, what we are doing, I'm taking the example of the first one here. So if I'm checking this one and these two are checked, meaning all of them are checked, then I will check the validate all, which is the one at the, at the end here. And we're doing the same on the other one. So making, the, making sure that when I'm checking a new one, if the others are checked, I do need to check the all, the validate all button. On the opposite, if it's unchecked, I don't care if the others are checked or not. At least if, if one is unchecked, I, I know that I need to uncheck my validate all because I don't want people to submit if at least one of the criteria is not met. So that's the well, kind of the second part of the logic here, but I believe it makes more sense to start with that because in the end, that's how you handle the combination of which fields are valid, yes or no. 
Now, how do we check these patterns? So on a text input, if you go into the behavior properties, you have expected format and you have some parameters to set the behavior, like minimum characters. On this one, we set three for the name. If I look at the message one in behavior, we set min characters to 10. On the email address, we didn't set a minimum characters, but we use instead a regular expression. I did not write this. I hate regular expressions myself. But in the, in the article I mentioned earlier, we do have an example just for validating email addresses. You might want to validate a, um, a birth date or, I don't know, a phone number, like three numbers, a dash three numbers, a dash four numbers for the US, for example. So this regular expression defines the um, kind of words or kind of sentence that you're expecting in a field. In these three cases, and I skipped the company because we didn't set this field as mandatory, we are using triggers of the text input. When the text input validates the entered text, meaning when the text meets the criteria set through the behavior properties, then we check its corresponding toggle button. When we identified an invalid text, we uncheck. That's about it. On each of these three text inputs, we'll check or uncheck these three OK buttons. Of course, you would put them outside of the scene. And these OK toggle buttons, when they are checked, will check the status of the, will verify the status of the other two toggle buttons. And if everything's green, blue, I guess, in this case, we turn on this one. And the last step is this submit button. We just said it is enabled when the validate all is checked. So a simple binding on a Boolean value, true, false. If this is checked, I can show you that here. If this button gets checked, the OK button, then my submit gets enabled. From the submit button, you do whatever you want. Send an email, log data in the analytics, whatever. That's about it in a nutshell for form field validation. The more fields you have, the more buttons you need, uh, the more conditional triggers or conditions in your trigger. Like this is checked, you would have one more condition if you have if you had one more mandatory, mandatory field, uh, but that's about it. Again, it's not the only way of doing it. It's one way, the one we describe in this uh, article that you can find in the Help Center. All right, uh, I think we're gonna... Uh, Thank you, Jeff. Going to open up to the questions, and I think we already have one, don't we? We have one, and I got a couple more for you, but we'll address Ron's first. So the question is, where does the data end up? Uh, well, good question, right? So you're validating data, you're hitting a submit button, and what? So it's, it's, it's up to you. There's a lot of things you could do, but go ahead. It is up to you, definitely. Uh, in this particular case, I decided to use the interface analytics. So I am logging an event on our data tracking uh, interface assets, and I'm logging the name, company, email, and message as four parameters. So in this particular case, all the data would go to our analytics hub, the interface analytics hub. Then I can don't just download my Excel file with all the data I've been logged, logging around the day, around the event, around the year, depending on where you're using this form. Uh, and again, that's one way if you want to send that to your own CRM through a web service, a REST API, you could do that with the API Explorer. If you wanted to save that on the local Excel file, you could do that as well. It's totally up to you. Thanks, Seb. I got a couple other questions for you. Excel file. Um, first of all, you're showing OK buttons. You don't have to show the OK buttons. That's to illustrate the principle, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, all these four buttons, usually I just put them like right here outside of the scene so nobody sees them. I mean, th this is a, a technique that power users do a lot, right? Where they put things off the side of the screen. Nobody can see it, but you use it to maintain a notion of state, right? To track things. Yeah, that you have multiple reasons to put buttons outside of the scene. In this case, I'm using basically the checked status of a toggle button. Is it checked? Yes, no, and then triggers on these buttons. Uh, another technique, which I used to call the, I still call the Paolo technique, uh, is to have uh, control buttons, like uh, buttons where you have a lot of different actions stacked one after the other, like a lot of animations. And instead of copying and pasting all these animations, 
you just use this simulate a click on these buttons outside of scene. I think I mentioned that in one of the previous Q&A sessions. I, you did, yes, you did. Um, one last question. Some people might be intimidated by the notion of regular expressions. You said that it's not, you know, it's not something you'll write yourself. I think even in the article, there's a reference to services that will generate it for you, right? Yep, here it is. So when we look at the regular expression, we give one example here. So we're not in interface here. <laughs> Uh, and they do have, I haven't used that in a while, but uh, you can test here the, the format that you want to use. And I think they had some templates somewhere, uh, match dates. That's the, how to match a date a date format, depending on your country, it might change. Uh, so lots and lots of options. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go into the details here. Yeah. But, and there, uh, there are other services too, I'm sure. And there are standards, I mean, on the web that you can look at about regular expression. This is not an interface stuff. It's it's a very common uh, cross-language uh, type of thing. We have lots to cover. Louis asked a question that might take a couple minutes. I'm gonna I'm going to say let's table that for now. Louis will come back to it. Uh, Seb, we'll move on to the next topic, which is a little deep dive on the shopping cart interface asset. Why don't you start looking? All right, so I'm gonna go back into play mode. So we can talk about the shopping list. So <clears throat> first of all, what is a shopping list? That's a, or a, a cart list or a cart or name it the way you want, the selection list. It's a list in which you can add items. You may want to change their quantity they may or may not have a price and you may or may not need a total price and a total number of items uh, out of your experience. Now, this list here is coming from Excel. I have another list coming from the headless CMS and that's the beauty of the shopping list. It's agnostic, it doesn't care where your data is coming from. So how does it work? Uh, how do you make this add to cart button uh, work and what can you do with, with this shopping list? I think I have, what, five minutes for that? Uh, so bear with me. Uh, first of all is, as Jeff mentioned, if you go into the Add an Interface Asset panel in your Composer and you start searching for Shop, you will find the Shopping List. So it is an off-the-shelf kind of generic interface asset. We try to make it as generic as possible, although, as you can imagine, every shopping list in the world is going to be different, depending on your products, depending on the, how many fields you need to describe a product, etc. But it's a good base to start. This shopping list, once it's added here, if you just drag and drop it on the scene, you will see this default panel on which basically I didn't change anything. Maybe I did one or two buttons, but that's it. So that's a good way to control what you're doing. Next, you need some products, some items to add to your list. So they need to come from somewhere, usually from a data feed, Excel, headless CMS, Airtable, through the API Explorer, any kind of ex external uh, CMS, we don't care. I'm using one with Excel here, this photo list. Most of you are familiar with these uh, vintage cars, African wildlife, beautiful dialing kind of pictures, right? Um, and I also have a second one out of the scene, this burger, which is coming from one of our headless CMS, uh, it's a the quick service restaurant uh, menu, All right? So in our list here, we have pictures, we have a text, we have a price, and we have this add to cart button. So I'm actually gonna delete the action and build it again for you just so you see how it works. So from the data template, I want to add, I want a button to be able to add this particular item to my shopping list. So on the shopping list, we have an add item action. And this is the kind of generic parameters we try to provide uh, without being too much and without being too little, we try to, right? So we need an ID, a unique identifier. If you have an ID in your database, that's ideal. Um, like in, uh, what's the word, EAN number or uh, an SKU. Uh, if you don't, just find something in your structure that is unique. So for these gallery photos, I'm just gonna use the artwork name because I know I don't have two pieces of art with the same name, that's fine. This ID, which we should have put a star here, that's mandatory. You need to have this ID filled 
in the shopping list and I'm going to show you why in just a second. Uh, then we did the name, so I'm going to reuse the same property. We can definitely use the same property for multiple fields. And all the others are, meant, are optional. Even the name is, is optional, right? In this case, I only care about the name and I'm going to use the price in here. And quantity by default, usually when you click on the add button, you, you add one item. Uh, if you had a text input or if you had done the plus minus before, the shopping list in the list, like I want, I don't know, three beers with my burger, uh, you could bind this to your text input. Not the case here. Now I skipped one thing and that's the image, right? And that's, that's the only tricky part when using this action. So remember, if I, I want to show the image in my result, in my shopping list, then we have to handle that. If we're talking about a restaurant or a menu, Maybe you don't because you just want something like, which looks like a, uh, a receipt, like a ticket printed, and you don't care about the image. But if you do, we do need to find out where this image is locally. And I'm gonna explain that. So back to my action. The item image here, the very first thing you would want to do when everybody did, myself included, because at some point I forgot about this kind of issue myself, is okay, I have my data feed. I have my path here. And remember, I'm working with an Excel file. So this is a relative path. So this is a folder next to my Excel file and the name of my image. If I give this to the shopping list, the shopping list has no idea what the Excel file is. It doesn't know where to find this folder because if I look into my shopping list interface asset folder, this doesn't exist. Let me illustrate that. If we go into our interface assets, I have my gallery artwork. That's my Excel file. I have the folder in which I have my photos. That's where the photos displayed here are coming from. If I add this gallery dash photos slash car one JPEG to the shopping list, the shopping list is gonna look into here. That's where the shopping list is. I don't have gallery photos. I don't have all the pictures here. And we don't want to duplicate that. That wouldn't make sense. So what I just did here will not work. Why does it work here? Because the image asset used to display the image is doing the conversion from Excel to the real path on, on the drive, the full path, like C slash my documents in, interface, etc. So instead of getting the data from the Excel, we're going to go into our scene and that's our template. That's the button we are using right now. We have the little blue dot. That's the image which is actually being displayed in the scene. And we have the image property. This is the full path. This is going to work. This will contain the full path you need and the shopping list doesn't care where the image is because you have an absolute path. This is going to work. And it's the same for the headless CMS in the end, because if you look into our headless CMS in this image, come on, image photo location, this one, in the image field, we have just the file name actually. And there's an internal mechanism when you're in a template like this, okay, this image is bound to supreme-b.png and my feed is a headless CMS. Oh. The CMS knows where to find the image. If I just give this string supreme-b.png to shopping list, has no idea where it comes from. We are losing the source of the data. So same ID, this button here, the add to cart from the CMS, all the ID, name, price are coming from the base itself, but the image is coming from the photo location, which is this one here, and its image property. I hope that makes sense. And it's a very common mistake. If you do it, you would just see a wide image with a cross, like can't find the image in your shopping list. Uh, ask support, they will know exactly how to, uh, what's the issue, or just remember this, uh, for the image, you need to know the full path of the image, which is being, the conversion is being done by image asset in your template. So that's about it on 
how to add items to the shopping list. I know we are running out of time and we have lots of other topics, so I'm going to go a bit more uh, quickly on, on the rest of it. You can always go into the article about the shopping list. We have a full article about the interface set. And you can see that once we have added items in our list, we do have these buttons, uh, plus, minus, and delete. If you look at the action, this plus button in the template is basically calling an action on the interface asset shopping list, uh, increment quantity or add quantity, and it, it waits one single parameter, the item ID, the unique ID, which is why this is mandatory. You need to have an ID. If you don't put an ID, all the items will go into one row. So all your add buttons will add vintage fraction, which wouldn't make sense. Uh, same thing if you hit the delete button, you're deleting, targeting a specific item ID. So when you have your list, what can you do with it? Uh, you can create an email body. That's a default action in the, on the interface asset. Uh, and if I show you that, what it looks like, uh, there is actually an HTML template uh, right next to the shopping list. So you can change the logo, you can change the CSS of your HTML, and then there are some placeholders uh, for the ID, the name, the quantity, and the price. So you can tweak that just adjusting the HTML right next to the shopping list. If you want to send that to a kitchen system for a quick service restaurant, an ordering system, a CMS, whatever, uh, you can create some JSON export, and that's the JSON again, by default, that the interface asset is producing. Now, the IE is written in JavaScript, meaning you can open the code and you can change it. If you need a specific format, format, some changing the name, this shouldn't be product name, this should be item name. Whatever your backend is awaiting, you can change that in the JavaScript yourself. That's for player for Windows and player for Android, iPad, the existing one. For player next gen, the process is gonna change slightly. Uh, with TypeScript, uh, but essentially you will be able to do uh, the same modifications. I think that covers uh, most of what you can do and how you can use the shopping list. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn over to you and see if we get any questions. Uh, we didn't have any posted, at least not yet. I have a couple for you. Um, the visualization of a shopping list here, is that using uh, the queue feature of Intuaface? What, that list on the right, where is that? That's a good question. And no, we are not using the sharing queue. Uh, it is actually a property exposed by the shopping list itself. So if I look into my default template, I have a list. So that's the list here. And that, that's, that's um, not easy to use because by default, your shopping list is empty. So how do you design uh, your content? Well, if we look at the shopping list itself, open the X-ray panel, we have two lists. We have the list items and we have list items design mode with fake products. So when I have my list here, I can switch the source. So if I select not the list, but it's data source, I can go into data source, shopping lists, and we have our two properties, list items and list items design mode. That enables me to see some fake products at edit mode at design time. Yes. And then I can go into my product name, for example, here. And I have access to the properties we expose from within the shopping list, these generic properties I was talking about. Don't forget, when you're done, switch back to the list, the real list else you will only see the fake products and never the real ones. I'll bet a lot of people on this call didn't even know you could change a data source the way you just did. So that's important to note, is that you can switch, you can keep the template and just change the data source. Yeah, and before anybody asks uh, why the bindings are not broken when I do that, uh, because my properties here between the list items and the list items design mode are exactly the same. So no typo allowed. When you when you do such a thing, item ID is item ID, and then the bindings are kept when you switch from one source to the other and vice versa. Uh, as Seb mentioned, the interface asset is written in JavaScript. Let's make a couple of things clear. First of all, this is sort of a, 
use at your own risk IA, and it's not something we really support. It's, as I said, a reference implementation. It's a starting point that we intend for you to adapt and modify and make work for you. So uh, is it bug free? I guess, I know, I don't know, but it's, it's not a formally supported feature of Intuaface. It is a frequently requested use of Intuaface. So Seb spent some time creating this IA, this interface asset. It's written in JavaScript, it's open source. You can read it, modify it. Um, if you don't know a lot about JavaScript, it could be an interesting way to reverse engineer because you know what you can expose in the product. So that could be interesting, but just keep that in mind. It is not meant to be used out of the box like this. Uh, maybe it could work for you, I don't know, um, but uh, feel free to make modifications, okay? Um, I think that's it. No other questions, Seb. So let's turn it over to you. The next topic, as I recall, is base duplication, right? It is, and we already had half an hour. So I de definitely need to go a bit faster here. So um, on the headless CMS, a feature which has been requested uh, quite a bit, and I, yeah, I see Ahmed is here. So yes, we released the duplication of the bases. So how does it work? Uh, let me go to my account, actually. I'm logged in as myself. I'm on one of the bases here. When you're in the dashboard list, so first thing, you need to have access to the dashboard. This space is actually not mine. It's owned by Demos uh, at Inface.com. But I, I'm, I have access to the base and I have access to the dashboard. When you have this dashboard access here, the green one, it means you will see this panel. You can add new users, etc. And on the right hand side, you have access to these base actions. So I can either duplicate the structure only or duplicate the structure and all the content. Now, if I do that while being logged in at this account, it will create a duplicate of this Infocom Bangkok base on my own account, money, money at interface.com. So it is sort of sharing a base with somebody else and allowing them to get ownership of a copy of the base. If I were logged in as demos, of course, I can do the same thing and I would have two bases side by side with the new name. And, uh, and that's about it. But for example, Raphael, who has access to this, to the content of this base, he cannot duplicate the whole base. But so, yeah, that's a quick, I mean, it's not a complicated feature, we all get it. Um, but what you can't yet do today, and the feature is under development, we might actually see it in a month or two, is to reassign a base to a new account, to assign it to somebody else that does not yet exist. But what you can right. do today, as Seb said, is if I have dashboard access to an to a base, then when I duplicate it, the copy is put into my account. So it's a pull, it's not a push. I can pull the copy in, thus yes, moving yes. it from one account to another. And I see Ahmed says he already used it successfully, so thanks for the feedback. <laughs> Always appreciate that. Perfect. All right, great. So, Thank you, Seb. So uh, next, uh, yeah. next about the headless emails. Um, multiple bases. And why would you want to use multiple bases in a single experience? A um, couple of reasons, uh, but the major one might be different user permissions. So again, I'm not gonna show you the whole thing, uh, just trying to explain uh, an example where we did that ourselves for this Infocom Bangkok event uh, that was in uh, November, I believe. So most of you might be familiar with the interface presentation, AKA interface overview experience that we use in all our demos on our booth, et cetera, where we show, let me show some content. Uh, we show our video showcase, we show our architecture with composer player, HTMS analytics, et cetera. So all this um, marketing stuff, which is decided at the corporate level uh, of interface by Jeff, Chloe and, and their team. So all of this is kind of a, not written in stone, but that's one big block, which we don't change often. And when we do, we want this to make sure that only Jeff or Chloe or myself can change that. For the Infocom Bangkok event, we wanted to create something which was uh, based on the interface overview, uh, but also adding some fun stuff, like some Nextmosphere sensors and some content more dedicated to the Asian market. 
So what we did is we made a copy of the interface overview experience, which we named interface overview dash infocom 2022. And instead of polluting our interface overview base and adding some infocom Bangkok specific content in there, we created a second base. In this base, we have some customer samples uh, with videos and images dedicated to the Asian market, as well as the next Mosphere settings that Raphael was going to use on his device uh, in Bangkok, which was actually a bright time XT4. So if I go to XC5, the new ones, to prototypes. Because I wasn't on site, I had no idea which buttons would be plugged on which USB on the next Mosphere bridge. So I wanted to make sure that I could tweak that remotely from the US while somebody else is actually setting this in Asia. And again, while keeping all of this separate from our main base, the interface overview. So that's that's basically the one example of why would you want to use two bases. Uh, if you look into uh, Composer, in here, I'm actually using two bases. Come back to edit mode. Uh, the burger kiosk, which I just showed you with the, sh with the shopping list, and this other base, which I'm going to use in the next scenes, in the next example. So you can add as many as you want. Um, and and the, the main idea here in our case is that if I go back to our Bangkok example, again, on the dashboard, Demos, myself and Alex, we were making the whole stuff and Raphael could change the content. If he wanted to add some snapshots for the customer samples or change the Nextmosphere settings on his own, he could, but he could not break the content we have at the uh, corporate uh, level with all our regular video showcase, all our uh, composer architecture, things like that. That's in a, in a nutshell. Why would you want to use two bases uh, or more, but uh, two like a, a main higher level uh, marketing base with some almost written in stone content and then some more local content or even driven content uh, while keeping things as clean as you can uh, without creating, creating a kind of a Frankenstein base where some stuff is active, some is not, and it's super difficult to maintain. I hope that gives some ideas, probably going to raise some questions. So again, don't be shy, uh, use the question box and either we address them right now or maybe at the end of the session. Yeah, I think a lot of people are still just getting used to using the headless CMS in general. Um, it's, uh, you know, again, we've been able to extract information from third party CMSs for years. Um, headless CMS does have some advantages. One of them, it was really cool seeing you use variants to change which Nexus to your device to vary the settings. I mean, that's pretty awesome. And uh, uh, people may not have even thought of using it in that kind of context, but you're setting parameters for an interface asset using a headless CMS base with variants depending on the, that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah. all managed in the one base. And I think that's also a good transition for the next topic. But I'll let you introduce that. Uh, yeah, so we, um, no questions, but people should continue. Don't be shy, type them up. You can be anonymous if you want. Um, location, location, location. I have multiple devices running the same experience, but the devices are in different locations and the information displayed by those experiences will vary based on that location. Same experience, different location. How do you do that with a headless CMS? That's what we're talking. Yeah, and we're going to address two um, main two cases. The simple case, which is one device equals one location. And the more advanced case, N devices, multiple devices can be assigned to one location. So simple case, one device to one location. Uh, <clears throat> and when I presented that experience to Jeff yesterday, he asked me, hey, why don't you use just the location feature of the uh, system information that you get? Because I want to put the Chicago content on my computer, but I'm I'm supposed to be in Chicago, but I'm not. I'm in Tucson, US. Thank you, <laughs> my internet connection for giving my IP address and, and giving my real location at the moment. So one, uh, the first step is to identify what is your identifier, what defines a device as opposed to another one. And in this case, we're going to use the display name or device name. And how do you create the content on the other end to react? to this criteria. So in here, 
I have some default generic location at the moment because I didn't set any timer, any trigger automatically to select that. But if I do select my location, it's going to use my name. And it's going to play that's Seb's desktop. Yes, that text will only be displayed on my desktop, and that's pictures I'm allowed to display. So, how does it work on the back end? I'm going to go back to our base, and that's as I mentioned the, the second base I'm using in this example. And we are going to take a look at our structure and first our simple case. So, in this simple case, I have defined a location name some location-specific demo text, and a list of media, a playlist, to be displayed. You see the green dots here? It means that to the whole component, so this whole thing, the two texts and the list, are depending on a variant. They are depending on this simple location device name variant, which is the one I have defined here. If I go into this list, I uh, have my default generic location, you know, just to test stuff to make sure that my assigning my device name would work. And then I can add my devices. So let's say I wanted to add uh, maybe Seb's laptop. I could do that. And I'm going to publish that. So there will be a new device that is supposed to use this exact experience, the exact same experience. I have nothing to change on the experience side. Then what happens on the content side? On the content, now I have this combo box, this drop down list where I can select Chicago NUC. That's the one I'm using right now. So this text will only display on Seb's desktop PC. That's true. That's what we saw. And then in my <coughs> list in Chicago, I do have the three uh, vintage cars pictures. I added this new Seb's laptop. So this is empty. If I go back to the core component, we have. For Seb's laptop, we have some empty fields. That's where you would fill in the content for this new device, aka new location. Now, how do you make the matching? This happens in Composer. What, what is this button doing, basically? So, on the left-hand side of the scene, this gray panel here is also just a default design accelerator to show you the data I'm using here. But among our interface assets, we have one which is called the system info, system information. This will give you all the information about the experience running, the, about the device running your experience. So right now I'm in Composer, but that would be the same in the player. That includes the device name and the display name. And yes, these two are different. Um, also, the player tags, we'll use them in a bit. Uh, is it composer, is it player, and some location based on your IP address. Do not trust that. I can show you three different names here depending on which connection, connection I decide to use. So not reliable, in my opinion. The device name is the device, is the name of your device at the hardware level or the OS level. So that would be my Windows. If I go open my system info in Windows, that's what I would see. The display name, aka the nickname, is what you can change in the interface share and deploy console. So when you have a player in your console, you can rename your device uh, and that's the display name here. So one or the other, I like to use the display name because I have an enterprise account, so I can rename my players and it's, make, it's usually easier. Uh, so I know exactly, I can give some uh, relevant names uh, to my devices. And then this button is doing something very, very simple. This button is setting a variant, my simple location variant, if I unbind this, I have the list of Jeff, Chicago NUC, and Seb's laptop. These are the variants we defined in the base. But I'm changing that dynamically, reusing my system info, device info, and display name. That's it. Use this value to select this variation. Done. One to one. One device will display will have one set of content to display. So I think for the simple case, that should cover um, most of it. I'm going to switch to the advanced case. And again, if you have any questions about that, uh, don't hesitate to go in the question box. We'll try to address them at the end of the session. Uh, and you will also have access to the recording of this session if you want to review that and try to make it work on your end as well. So what if you have more devices 
more than one devices into a single location. Uh, you have actually two options, at least, that I could, I could think of. So let me talk actually about the second one because I like this one better. If you have an enterprise account, an enterprise interface platform, one of the easiest ways to use the player tags. In your player tags, you can add something like I did here, location, column, Chicago. That's what I assigned to my actual player. And it can have other tags, we don't care about that. And then when you do select a location, you can say, I want to select my location based on that Chicago value. How do I retrieve that? And that's a little bit of the advanced stuff, but again, we have an article explaining that. I have a variable bound to my player tag. So that's the whole string, location column Chicago, comma, device column desktop, comma, third tag, comma, fourth tag, et cetera. And among this string, I am looking for the value behind location. So location column, what? Chicago, that's the value I'm extracting from this whole string. And then I can do my one-to-one -one crisp uh, matching with the name of the variant. Player tags, we have a full article about that. I will show, show that at the end. But just so you know, if you have an enterprise account, you can assign tags to your players and then just give the name of the variant directly in your tags. That's the easiest uh, probably way of doing that. Now, if you don't want to do that or you don't have an enterprise account, you can still handle multiple devices uh, for one location, but what you will need to set up is a lookup table. So I'm gonna go switch back to the base and explain that here. If I go into my advanced case, so same ID, location name, specific text, media playlist, don't look at that yet. In this case, I have a blue dot. I assign the blue dots to these two texts and to this media list, that's my advanced location. In my location, I have same thing, uh, default, and then Boston and Chicago. Now, in addition to this structure, so the two texts and the media playlist with vary under location, I have another collection which does not vary. And that's my lookup table. Device name, location. Meaning, if I go into the content, that should be a bit more explicit. In this list, in this table, I can assign a location to a device name. So my NUC desktop and my laptop should display the Chicago content. Jeff's NUC and Jeff's iPad should display the Boston content. No idea who this is, but that's probably me or Jeff doing some tests before the webinar. <laughs> uh, so whatever this device is, it will display the Boston when we publish that. When you have this table, what you can do is you can filter it based on the device name as we did earlier from the system info. When you filter it, you will get the location. And then in your main base, you can just, okay, assign the result of your filter. Back into player, I'm gonna hit play and show you these two steps, one after the other. All I'm showing here, whether it's the simple case or the advanced case, I'm using buttons for the demo purpose. I would use a timer trigger or even better, uh, the headless CMS sync completed trigger. So I know the base has been synced, synchronized locally, uh, and I can just uh, start filtering it and start changing the variants, et cetera, et cetera. So we have our lookup table here. Uh, right now, my display name is Chicago NAC 10. So when I filter this list, that's the result of my filter. So it's like row number one of an Excel file, if you will. When I have my result, I could double check that I don't have zero items. I have only at least one. Uh, then I can select my variant using this particular value. So the result of my filter and now I get my Chicago content. The nice thing about that is if you have like moving kiosks, uh, if your devices or loan devices that you send to an event or another one, you can say, okay, this desktop, I am sending it to Boston. So I need to publish my changes. And when somebody's gonna launch that experience again, or 
use the sync to resync the content to check if I need to have new content displayed. Then in my lookup table, Chicago Net should show Boston. So if I filter, the result of my filter is Boston. Select. Now I'm getting the nice animals. That's the Boston content as opposed to the cars. Lookup table, if you don't have the enterprise or you don't want to use the, play, the tags for whatever reason, or using the player tags and uh, assigning your Chicago content. My player tag is still Chicago, so now I'm switching back to the content I'm supposed to display on my uh, desktop right now using my player tags. One or the other, both works great. That's the article I wanted to mention. Manage experience content using player tags. We have simple tag, we have advanced tag. That's actually the one I used here with this, uh, what is that? Scene column lunch, for example, we have, that's the example we have here. And that's the weird custom script I was using. So everything is, you can just copy that, change this thing with the, the key of your tag, like key value pair, location column Chicago, put location here, this line will give you Chicago as a result. I'm definitely out of time. So Jeff, let's open to the questions and see what else we got. Can you quickly open the share and deploy console to show how player tags look at the uh, device I level? I can definitely do that. So that's my player, Chicago Nactam. And these are the tags. So location, column, Chicago. Uh, I could add, I don't know, uh, content, calls, whatever tag. Uh, and I'm just typing here a key column value. You don't have to. Uh, you could just search for a word. That's the simple tag uh, feature that is mentioned in the article. I like this key column value, uh, yeah, key value pair because it's a bit more controllable. But that's it. Yeah, if you read the article, we we recommend that approach. You don't have to do that approach, but it has advantages in the article. We'll, we'll discuss that. Um, but it's just a text string. As, as far as uh, the, the notion of a tag is concerned, it's just a string of characters. That's all. It's anything yeah. you want. Uh, we did receive a couple of questions. I have a couple of my own. Let's go to the ones that were asked. Uh, the first one was, can you, from the headless CMS, force a sync at the device level? Every time we talk about sync with the headless CMS, it's the experience initiating, and it's happening at the device with the experience. Uh, can you push a sync? That, uh, Seb, I'll give you a second to answer that, but I, I will say that it's always a bit risky to force an update when you don't know what's happening on the screen. Because if you force an update, you could be stealing focus away from a person that's in the middle of a transaction of some kind. So that's always the risk. Um, and so by doing it at the experience level, you can do it at a time that is convenient for the audience using the kiosk. You don't steal their focus or change things. Um, that's my two cents, Seb. And, and so you can't. Yeah. You cannot today. Maybe one day you can. You cannot today. There's yes a reason no. maybe you shouldn't, but go ahead. So that's true. You cannot, from a single button in the base, uh, say, refresh content. Uh, one of the reasons is, as Jeff mentioned, if somebody is interacting with your kiosk, you may not want to sync the content right now without checking what's the status of the kiosk. That being said, there is a way to send a command to the experience and have the experience handle that command to decide if it should sync yes or no. Uh, and that's called web triggers. So if I go into my experience, I can add the web triggers interface asset. I search for web. Web. Web triggers. And I can say, when I'm going to receive a message, which could be a sync base, whatever, then I could be brute force and just call the sync action. You could do that. That's the brutal way. Or you could save that info into a Boolean and then make sure if I'm in the attract screen, uh, then sync. If I'm not, wait until I'm back in the attract screen, then do the sync. So several ways of handling that on the composer side, handling this web trigger message arriving into the experience. Do I do it right now? Or am I a bit more clever because I don't want to interrupt my users? 
then how do you send that web trigger? Well, we have an API. So you could push, I don't know, a big red button on your desk that sends an IoT to Zapier uh, and an IoT command to Zapier or IFTT and that calls this web trigger API on our end. That would be an option. Uh, lots and lots of different options. So you can create a dedicated, super simple web page in your intranet that would do that. We just don't have this button at the moment in the headless CMS space. Thank you, thank you. There were another question was, you emphasize the value of player tags. Um, it's a, it basically one less step, right? Because um, you don't need the lookup table. Yep. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm reading the question from Scott at the moment. Yeah. I mean, so maybe reading it out loud. Maybe. Well, I was going to say that. So the question is, should I ever use a lookup table versus the player tags? Remember, you need enterprise level into a face account to work with the player tags feature. A reminder, you also need enterprise for remote deployment. So if you have multiple devices in multiple locations and you're not using remote deployment, you could do it. Pretty inconvenient. So chances are, if you have distributed deployments, you're going to want the enterprise tier anyway, in which case you're going to have player tags. But Seb, is there any reason ever that, well, even if I can do player tags, I'm better off with the lookup? Um, I'm biased because I think I know what project Scott is talking about and I know how many devices are involved. So um, um, there are two things. On the composer side, using the lookup table, as Jeff mentioned, is a two steps thing. Now, is it going to take uh, 20 milliseconds instead of 10? Yes. Do we care? No. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, now, when you're going to set up your players, there are two two things to keep in mind. If you do a batch player activation, when you're going to assign your template, your CSV, you can set tags automatically at this level to your players. So even before interface is installed on the devices, uh, let me open the template. I believe you have that here. I haven't done that in a while. But you should have player tags. So you can assign player tags in this batch file uh, directly before even assigning licenses or while assigning licenses to your players. So if you're planning ahead your large deployment, assign the tags at this moment in your process and, and don't worry about anything else. Just make sure that your headless CMS base variant names or variation names, the locations, have the exact same names as the one you set up in your Excel file. That's on the player tag side. Now, if you go into this CMS stuff, well, you can also import this as a, as a CSV and you can do that as many times as you want. So you can redo that. You can clean up the whole table and re-import it again. So which one is better? Honestly, I don't know. Both are valid. Uh, I like the player tags. Um, because it's it's just one step in Composer, uh, and because when you look at your where are they the list of players here, if you do a list view, you can see the tags, and you can filter by tags. So having these tags here help me to manage my one single device. <laughs> Does make sense, right? Uh, but you have uh, 150 devices in here. You can search by tags, make sure everything is up to date, look at the thumbnails. Uh, so it's it's a dual purpose of the tags, which in my opinion are still a good thing to use for larger deployments. I th There is, I guess, a scenario, Seb, which is the devices are going to be moved, so the location is going to change. And the person who's going to record the fact that they've been moved does not have access to the share and deploy console. They only have access to this. That means they that, cannot apply a lookup table. They cannot modify player tags. That would be a scenario. That's, that's correct. Uh, that, that's another advantage for the lookup table uh, versus the tags uh, and vice versa. Maybe the IT doesn't have access to the CMS because you don't want an IT guy to talk about content. Um, so, so Louis asked a question, or he's asked a question now, they're really both about features that we don't have yet. 
So the first one was when we were talking about form field validation. So let's revisit that. So let's open up the floor, by the way, so we can ask questions about this uh, particular location-based uh, thing, or you can ask, you know, whatever you want. So uh, back when we talked about form field validation, Louis was asking about having a text property. I think that the property, that the, the, uh, the asset itself would reject the entry rather than having an extra step. Nice idea. I, I mean, it's not a feature. If I understood you correctly, Louis, that's not a feature, certainly. And I don't know that it's something that's currently planned. It, this validation would be a separate step. I'm reading the question again, uh, just to make sure. So would you ever add the integration of the validation process directly within the text input properties? Well, it is, because if you look at the text input, this validates the entire text and in, identifies invalid text triggers or at the text input level already. It's combining the three of them to decide what you want to do with this submit button, which is not, which is have to go with some kind of logic. Uh, now we did that in this sample to disable the submit button so that you know you cannot click the submit button until the three fields are valid. Another option could be to say you have a submit button, and this submit button is looking at each text input independently and on the behavior you have text validated true or false so you could say if this is true and the three of them are true then do whatever you want if this is not true then show an error message there you go what what i don't like about this personally and which is why when i wrote this article years ago i didn't do this solution is that i don't want to let people think they can click on the submit button where in fact they can't that's me, right? But you can do it if you want to. That's great. Uh, I, not, I forgot about that. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, just thinking of, of this, maybe there's an even a better way. Uh, because if we have, if we'd had a free value comparison interface set in our library, which we do, you could bind A, B, and C to the is validated to this, this, and this and the output would be true or false, and you could bind your submit button on this output. Boom, that works. If you have three values. Lots and lots of options. <laughs> Eight, four, three. If you want four, uh, change the JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, Louis' other question was about white labeled headless CMS. Where's that in the roadmap? Good question, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know that don't it's either. your term, but uh, we can get back. Well, I can tell that the base duplication was the last one. Uh, reordering items in the content is the next one or one after the next one, and reassigning base ownership is also in the uh, in the short term list. I think I am allowed to say that. Well, I said it already. So, um, question about the size of the notes field for an experience. I don't even know that it has a limit. Mike is wondering if it could be bigger. I actually have no idea. I have, you know, how big is that field? Is that something we can check right now? Um, sorry, I was trying to read and, and catch up with the comments. Is there a way to having a bin on notes field while editing the info of the XP? Which one? So are we talking about this? I think so. Right, Mike? You're talking about description. Yes, correct. He says it's short. I don't know. I never I use it. I don't even know. Go for it. Just type the letter A and count it until it stops. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I never, ever use this field. And I mean, yes, okay, you cannot expand that. Um, I don't know, how many of you have the needs? That's, um, Mike, that's something that you should post in the community in the wish list section. We'll see how many votes we get and uh, if, it, if it makes it yeah. to the roadmap or not. I mean, maybe it's uh, you're just scrolling as part of the issue. You don't want to scroll. It should all be visible. It should grow. Yeah, and usually in Chrome or Edge, you should get this corner to expand the field. I don't know why yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. do it here. So. 
yeah, it might be nothing Hello. for us to change and to make this expendable. So that's a good one. Everything has a cost. And, uh, uh, I don't see other questions. Did I have any others off of tags? Um, only that um, when I first saw the solution, I did wonder why we weren't using the city for the system info information uh, information asset. You you address this, but I guess it's just worth revisiting. It'd be so tempting to use the city. Yeah, but it's just not that reliable. I guess uh, now we're not choosing that city name. That's it's we're doing a lookup based on the IP address, right? It's nothing we're doing. So these four information here, if I go into system info location. All these four fields are retrieved from the IP address through a third party service. Third party service. Uh, yep. So, in my case, I, I can share that with you. If I were to switch from one connection to another, I would now be in Chicago with my ATT plan. And if I switch to SFO, I would be in Paris with my French plan. So, that's how I can trick everybody on where I am. <laughs> Don't do that. I guess in general, it's probably reliable, but you can't trust it. I, you know, it's, uh, I guess, uh, it's so much safer to do what Seb was recommending. Yeah. Um, or you're not really in Tucson, you're just outside Tucson, you know, so it doesn't come up as Tucson, even though that's what you put in your lookup table. And so it's, it's just a little sensitive. Or your internet works. provider decides to change a thing in their setup and you cannot control that. And you yeah, wouldn't be aware yeah, of that true. change. Uh, what I can tell you is I get, this happens to me all the time. If I log into my Google account or log into an Apple account and it says, you just had a login from X and it's very often not where I am, you know, and I think that's probably my, my internet provider. So, so it's, it's a you know, good example of that. Uh, Seb, I don't have any more questions for you. We're pretty much at the hour, but let's give, oh, we're past the hour. Yeah. Uh, let's give folks a moment to, uh, See if there's have any other questions because we only do this once every three months. This is a nice opportunity. Uh, okay, we got a couple coming in. Seb, you see those? Uh, I see the one from Mike. Wasn't I able to have a binding from another scene object? Is it now done via the global settings? So being able to do some binding on another scene or Call an action on an asset in another scene has been removed. It's been deprecated uh, because it was causing a lot of issues on some platforms, uh, including memory issues. Because in the end, you need to have both scenes loaded all the time to, to make sure that the objects were existing. So kind of a bad practice in the end. Uh, the alternative is to use an experience layer uh, where the object belongs to the whole experience, not just to a scene. Uh, or global variables. And we do have an article, how to pass information between scenes about that, uh, that covers these two uh, solutions. Yep. Uh, typography controls, we get asked about that once every three months. Um, certainly All not right. in the short term. Yeah, no, still not. So we know, we know. Uh, can you link a shopping list trigger action to an Exmosphere sensor? I think I understand the question, and generally speaking, the answer would be, would be yes. You can call any action from any trigger, so do whatever you want. But if the scenario is like a uh, pick, an, pick up an object on a shelf using an, uh, an RFID sensor or a pickup sensor from the Exmosphere, and call an action on the shopping list using the ID of that tag. Yeah, sure. You can even do an add remove from the shopping list and you could use the shopping list as a comparison list. It doesn't have to be a shopping list. That's maybe one of the messages I wanted to, to pass on today. That we call it shopping list because we had to give it a name, but in the end, it's a list of items where you can add, remove items, you can change their quantity, and you can do something with the output of that list. It doesn't have to be shopping. So I actually like to use it for comparison. Uh, and if I need more fields, I would just change the JavaScript and add the fields I need to transform this shopping list into a comparison list. 
Yeah, it's it's a list builder, is what it is. It's a list builder, and maybe it's to buy something. Maybe it's with a quantity and a price. Yeah. Well, the out of the box interface asset is quantity and price, but it doesn't have to. You can modify yeah. that and do whatever you want. Um, release date for PLN. It's already released. No, PLN for general be, availability. Play yeah. next gen. Play yeah. next gen. I, I, whatever I said, I meant uh, yes. It's <laughs> but it's available. It's still beta. Um, that it, it's fuzzy, right? Because we've we've been in beta for a while. People have been using it for a while. In fact, people can even now publish web publish to the web on their own. Um, but we have internally a list of features that we feel are minimally necessary to consider it ready for general availability. We're not there yet. I think if you ask the team, they're now saying first half of this year, um, but you're not going to get more specific than that in projection. You know, so we're trying to make it as available as possible without making it generally available. And so you can use it today. If you talk yeah, to what us. What I would say is we have, dozen, we have dozens of experiences published on the web already uh, for some of our bigger customers across the world. Uh, we have some deployments starting in venue on play and next gen, especially on lower powered Android devices. Uh, so yeah, you can have, you can have it. Mike is saying, oops, I used the bad technique. So now I need to change them, right? I think that's what you're asking. And yep. so Mike, yeah, the, the question was about the binding on other scenes and actions on other scenes. We deprecated the featuring composer, meaning for new experiences or editing existing experiences, you cannot do that anymore. You won't even see but the that, feature in the product. Yeah. You won't. But if you build it already, the player will keep supporting it unless it had the bug that we were trying to prevent. Um, so if your experience will still work in the next players, we are not removing the feature from the player. We are just preventing people to use that feature again anymore in Composer. And if you still want to use it, Hold the control key on your keyboard while doing that, and you will see the button you're missing. Don't don't tell anybody that. <laughs> hey, uh, you know what? We're getting some questions. I know we're way over, but we'll give. How about we give it thirty more seconds? Because uh, again, people don't usually get such access. I love my access to Seb. I get to talk to Seb all the time, but most people don't. <laughs> Jealous. Ooh, what's this? I let you read this one out loud, maybe. Yes. Um, uh, click on the text field, maybe using pop up. I think this is asking about. Um, Pulling up information. At the end of the day, I think this is a question about using an interface asset to access information stored someplace else. I think, and so you can use you can bind visual elements in a to a face to an external service. So you're reading from it, you're not writing to it, and then you can use that to make other calls to pull that information in. That's what I think I'm reading. Yeah. So, Ron, maybe is that something you want to uh, ask us directly in private in an email or through our support platform? Uh, so we can know a bit more what kind of service we're talking about. But uh, in the end, if you want to access the data from a web service in the list, like the uh, the gallery pictures I showed earlier, uh, and then when you click on that item number two, you want to display more information about this particular product. If your backend has such an API to get give me detailed information about product number two, then yeah, sure, you can do that through the API Explorer. It's really usually, related to the backend you, you, you're going to use. That's what I was going to say. I mean, usually for questions like this, the, the, the answer is if the service you're working with enables it, then we can do it. Because for us, it's just another API call. That's all. One API call is show me the list. Another API call is show me the information about this particular item. As long as the API exposes it, then we can call it. You know. So it's not so much about us. Um, all yeah. right, Sam, it's a quarter. Yeah. I think so, we're good. Uh, I was going to say 
thanks for bearing with me and probably the distracting thing over my head. That's the first time with this new background. And you know what? Trying to do that in a city where it's going to be 70 or 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 20, 25 Celsius today, and the sun is coming up right next to me, not the easiest thing to handle with a webcam. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, I'm in my car. I'm in my car, and you can't even tell. This is like perfect green screen. Um, uh, yeah, we're trying to professionalize things a little bit, you know, new mics and lighting, and you know, we'll continue to make things better. Uh, Seb, as always, thank you very, very much. Uh, same thing to our audience. We will continue to do this quarterly, but please don't ever be shy. As always, technical support, your sales rep, send in your questions. Uh, join the community if you haven't already. That We uh, continue to work heavily to make the community a, a profitable place for people to invest their time. And uh, you don't have to wait three quarters, uh, three months to get an answer to a question. This is recorded. We will send out the recording in a day or two. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks, Seth. Thank you. Bye-bye, and Happy New Year again. Happy New Year.